Hi, I'm Jelena from Zurich Instruments. In this video, you will learn about the basic working principles of locking amplifiers. Locking amplifiers are among the most widely used general tools in today's physics and engineering labs. In the broadest sense, they're used to measure the amplitude and the phase of an oscillating electrical signal. Let's have a quick look at a typical measurement situation. The device under test is probed by a pure periodic signal, and the result is measured by the lock-in amplifier with respect to a reference. Large signals are easy to measure even with an oscilloscope, but become challenging when the signal is so small that it is buried in the noise. This is where the lock-in amplifier makes a difference as it combines techniques from the time and frequency domain analysis. Now let's see how it works. The lock-in takes the input signal, along with the noise, as well as the reference signal, and puts them through a frequency mixer. The signal mixing is equivalent to multiplication of the two inputs and best understood in the frequency domain. When the signal and the reference are sine waves at frequencies fs and fr, this operation results simply in the two components at the sum and at the difference of the two. For most lock-in applications, signal frequency and reference frequency are identical and equal to f. So we end up with a component at the DC, or 0 Hz, and another component at twice the frequency, or 2F. After mixing, the lock-in amplifier separates the DC component from the 2F part by means of an adjustable low-pass filter. Main characteristics are the bandwidth and filter order. The filter bandwidth, or the minus 3 dB point, is the cutoff frequency where signal power is attenuated by half. This bandwidth is inversely proportional to the time constant. Setting the filter bandwidth is always a trade-off. Making it too wide will lead to systematic measurement errors, as the 2F component may be leaking into the output signal. Moreover, a larger bandwidth means more noise, and hence a lower signal-to-noise ratio. On the other hand, choosing a filter bandwidth that is too narrow will limit the time resolution and will slow down the measurements. The shape of the filter can also be adjusted by choosing its order. A higher order leads to more ideal, rectangular filter transfer function that blocks frequencies outside the filter bandwidth more efficiently, but takes more time to settle, causing a phase delay. A lower order filter has the advantage of causing less phase or temporal delay, which helps whenever highest speed requirements need to be met. The entire principle of mixing and low-pass filtering is called the phase-sensitive detection or demodulation. In order to understand the whole demodulation process of mixing and subsequent filtering for non-sinusoidal signals, we can make use of the Fourier theorem. It states that every periodic function can be expanded as an infinite sum of linear independent functions of sine and cosine terms. Demodulation applied to such an expression is equivalent to selecting the terms with frequencies within one filter bandwidth around the signal reference. Usually, this reduces the infinite sum to a single sine and cosine term. All other frequency components average to zero. Now, if we look again at the sketch, the signal coming out from the low-pass filter, as described earlier, is termed the in-phase component, often labeled with X. It corresponds to cosine wave demodulation, which provides one of the two Fourier components. We get the other linear independent Fourier component when we demodulate the signal with a sine wave equivalent to delaying the reference by 90 degrees. This term is often labeled Y, or quadrature component. Once we have our X and Y components, the locking calculates the amplitude R and the phase angle theta by simple transformation from Cartesian to polar coordinates. Most lock-in amplifiers today are able to output x, y, r, and theta as analog signals with a scaling factor and offset, or as digital values to be stored and analyzed on a computer. But what makes a really good lock-in amplifier? Clearly, you need to make sure that the frequency range and the maximum measurement bandwidth matches your application requirements. In addition, you need to check a few other parameters. For most applications where lock-in is used, Achieving high signal-to-noise ratio is of utmost importance. Hence, the lock-in amplifier's own noise, usually referred to as input noise, needs to be as small as possible for each input range over the entire input bandwidth. Here is an example of a lock-in with an input noise of only 2.5 nanovolts per root square hertz, 
with 1 over f component picking up at 100 Hz down to lower frequencies. A second important consideration is the dynamic reserve, which quantifies the capability of an instrument to reject unwanted signal components while still providing accurate results. With a dynamic reserve of 120 dB, for example, you can measure a 1 microvolt signal with a specified accuracy of 1% with a nearby disturbance of up to 1 volt. Last but not least, modern digital instruments and state-of-the-art software allow you to analyze the input and output signals in the time and frequency domains, which is a great asset in improving your measurement quality. Additional functionality can be added using a set of programming languages such as LabVIEW, MATLAB, Python, and C. I hope this video provided a first understanding of the basic working principles of lock-in amplifiers and perhaps some inspiration for their use in your experiments. For more detailed information, please check out our white paper and contact us directly to discuss your application. Thanks for watching.